Cats Cassidy Games, 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 Board Game Blitzes, Games, Games, Showing your favorite games. My number 30 is Pandemic Legacy Season 1, which is a cooperative game where you're trying to work together to save the world from diseases. If you've played Pandemic, it's like that, but there's a legacy aspect to it where each time you play through a game, it's a month, and then new things come out with new rules and new story to the game. So things change each game you play, and there's a total of 12 months you play, and then at the end you're done with the story. There's also a season two that I haven't played yet, but I have a lot of fun playing through the campaign and you get different characters and like new characters come out and you get to play as them. They have different powers and you can do different actions on your turn. Um, so it's really fun trying to figure out what you need to do to save the world. And then the rules that change as the game goes on add twists to the game that also make it really fun. So that's why Pandemic Legacy season one is my number 30. My number 29 is Trajan, which is actually my first how to play video was that game. But in Trajan, you're trying to get the most points by doing different things. The main mechanism is a Moncala type thing where you pick up little pieces and move them around a board and wherever you land is what action you do. But you can also get a bonus Trajan tile if you match up colors on the end bowl. And so it's fun to plan that out and you're trying to plan out to be able to do the different actions that get you different points. And if you do a bunch of one action, you end up getting more points as you do it more. So you have to plan out on your own little Moncala board when you want to do which actions because once you've done an action, the pieces change and so you can only land on whatever you can land on when you uh, do the whole dropping one off at a time. So it's really fun planning that out. There's pretty much no theme in the game, but I still have a lot of fun doing the Moncala part and trying to do all the different actions and trying to do the best actions to get the good score that you want, but also like comboing the different things that you need to do. So that's why Trajan is my number 29. My number 28 is Monikers, which is a party game where you're on teams and you're trying to guess words. But the twist is that the, there's different rounds. In the first round, you can say anything except for the words that you're trying to guess. The second round, you can only say one word. And then the third round, you can't say anything, you just do gestures. But each round, you get the same set of words. So you have like 40 cards that are the words um, that you have throughout the game. And as the rounds go on, everyone starts knowing what the words are. It's similar to a game called Time's Up, but I like monikers better because the words are sometimes really long phrases that are funny and hard to get and also it has like a description or a picture or something that tells you what the thing is because you don't necessarily have to know what the word means but someone who's guessing will know it because at the beginning of the game the way the words get picked is people pick from their hand of cards what's going to go in so someone has seen the word and it's a really weird word or phrase that you haven't heard of but you can read the description and figure out what it is. And by the end of the game, there's just, so people have made these weird associations so that just by acting out something that may be completely unrelated, people will be able to guess. So that's why Monikers is a lot of fun and I love playing it at parties with a lot of people. My number 27 is Crokinole, which is a dexterity flicking game. There's a big, circular wooden board in a hole in the middle and you're trying to flick your piece into the hole in the middle. At first you have to get your piece either in the middle or like in a circle in the middle or else it doesn't count and you lose the piece. But later if there's if your opponent's piece are on the board then you have to hit their piece first or else your piece doesn't count and you get it out. So as more pieces get on the board it gets harder like trying to make sure you hit a piece, but then also trying to get the highest score because there's rings and the inner ring is worth more than the outer rings and you can knock your opponent's pieces off. So it's a lot of fun and it's a really quick game. We usually just play like one round as a game, but I think you can play where you, you do multiple games and it's the best of a certain number of games, but you can also play four players as teams and it, it's really quick to learn and fun to play and it's, Looks really cool on the table. It's really big though. So yeah, that's Crokinole, my number 27. 
My number 26 is 1817, which is another 18xx game. This one I've only played twice, so I'm definitely not an expert in it at all, but I did play with people who have played it over a hundred times. And it's a really interesting game because there's a lot of different things you can do with the stocks. There's a stock market where you can short shares. So if you think a company is worth more than it will be later, you can short it, which basically means you can sell shares that you don't own and then later you'll have to buy it back up or you're hoping that the company will go bankrupt and you won't have to, so you get free money. So there's a lot of things you can do with that to short shares to get money yourself and then you can put it to other use. But if you do it too much and it's too risky, you could also hurt yourself a lot and it's very risky. So there's a lot of things with the shares in 1817 and um, a lot of things to explore. It's a really long game, like five hour minimum, which is why I haven't been able to play it that much but I have enjoyed the times that I've played it a lot. And that's 1817. My number 25 is Yggdrasil, which is a game where you're playing as Norse gods trying to prevent the bad guys from getting to the tree Yggdrasil. So there's a board and there's different locations you can go to. Uh, you're not physically going to them, but it's the different actions that you can do on your turn and it's like building up your weapons and fighting against the bad guys. But you can't actually kill the bad guys because they're like big, the evil god things. And they're moving along a track and you're trying to push them back. So each time you fight them successfully, you can push them back and you're trying to keep them behind certain lines in order to win the game. You have to get through a deck of cards. Each turn a card flips over and that determines which bad one moves. And when you get through the deck of cards, then you win the game. So it's a survival game. But it's a lot of fun. It's similar to Ghost Stories, which I talked about earlier. Similar feeling with cooperative and trying to just survive. But uh, I like that each character comes with a different power and each of the evil ones also has a different power that they do whenever they move forward. They do something bad. So there's a lot of strategy in figuring out which evil ones you want to kill and you can also get weapons that do damage well against certain evil ones and so like you can specialize in which ones you're going to try to push back so uh, i've had a lot of fun playing yggdrasil my number 24 is northern pacific which is a really quick train game the game can last from like five to ten minutes and it's basically there's a long map and on your turn you either put one of your cubes that you start with onto a city on the map or you move the train. And the train goes across the map and it can't go backwards and once it hits the end of the map, then the game's over. So what you want to do is have the most cubes at the end of the game. And the way you get more cubes is when the train hits the city that your cube is in, then you get another cube back plus the original one. But if the train goes past your city without hitting it, then you don't get any cubes and that you lose that cube. So it's really interesting because there's shared incentive with people putting cubes in the same cities, but then someone else who doesn't have their cube in that city will want to move the train far away from the city and move it past it without the train hitting the city. So it's a lot of thinking about, oh, is that person going to move the train if I do this? Or maybe if I put it here, then this person will want to move the train here too. Or they want to move it here, so I'll put it in the city after so I can move it after them. So there's, there's a lot of that. And it's really quick and easy to learn and quick to play. So I really like playing Northern Pacific. My number 23 is a Rolling Stock, which is an economic card game with the most realistic stock market I've played, I think. So in Rolling Stock, each round there's new private companies that come out as the cards and you're bidding on them to try to get them into your possession. And then you can turn some of them into corporations that have shares and you issue shares and you set a stock price for it. But whenever you issue a share, the stock price goes down and the company gets that amount of money. And when you buy a share of a company, the stock price goes up, but you pay that new price instead of what it used to be. And when you sell a share, the stock price goes down and you pay the new price that's lower than it was before. So the stock prices are always changing and you're trying to get the most money yourself by using these corporations and the shares. Also, all the different private companies that you get 
have different colors and different names and they synergize with other specific companies. When, so when you put them into a corporation together with ones that synergize with each other, they get a bonus and get more money for that corporation. So it's interesting trying to build up a good corporation based on money because the corporations will have to buy the privates from players and you need enough money, Just the money's just exchanging hands everywhere and there's a lot of negotiation with that. Also, the stock prices can get crazy because there's only one card for each stock price and if a company is a certain stock price, then no one else can be that company. So if you have to jump up one and the one above you is taken, then you jump up two to the next free one. So if there's a bunch of companies open, then the stocks just go and jump, jump, leapfrog over everything, which is, I think, why it's called rolling stock. Another cool thing is that the stock prices change at the end of a round, depending on how much money the company has. So it, there's a lot of calculations in it, a lot of math in the game, so it's, it's a lot of thinking, but the, the booking value of the company is how much money it has and how much it's worth in the private companies that it's bought. That determines its stock value. So it can go up or down depending on that, which I think is, is really neat. So I really like playing rolling stock, and there's also a version 2 coming out that I've played as well that has a little less bookkeeping, and it's a little simpler, but it's still pretty difficult. And I like that one a lot too. But rolling stock is my number 23. My number 22 is Freedom the Underground Railroad, which is a cooperative game where you're trying to rescue slaves and free them, go from the south all the way up to Canada. You each play as different characters and each turn you're trying to spend money to get tokens that can either give you support or give you more funding or you can move the slaves around on the board. And there's different cities where the slaves stop and you move them and you're trying to eventually get them up to Canada. But each round also, new slaves come in on ships and they fill up the bottom part. So you're constantly trying to move them up and there's also slave catcher tokens that move around on the board and if they hit a slave, they'll capture them and they'll go back down to the south. So you're trying to balance getting support because in order to advance in the game you have to get a certain number of support tokens, but you have to balance that with also getting the slaves up to Canada and because you can't lose too many slaves or else you'll lose. There are also cards that you can get that help you or hurt you because there are bad things that happen. And it, the cards are very historical, they have flavor text and there's reasons for each of them that happen. I like how the game is really thematic because it makes you want to free the slaves as much as you can, but also you can't save everyone and it feels really bad when you lose some people. But that's why Freedom the Underground Railroad is my number 22. My number 21 is Sleuth, which is a deduction game with cards. So Clue was one of my favorite games growing up, and Sleuth is similar to that in that it's a logic deduction puzzle where everyone gets a hand of cards to start with, and the cards have different gems with different numbers and types of gems on them. And there's one that's taken out of the deck, and everyone's trying to guess that. So you have a hand of question cards that you give to someone that ask questions about how many cards they have. So for example, it would ask, how many blue opals do you have? And they have to answer truthfully. So when you get all this information, you have a sheet that you're marking down all the deduction and logic that you're doing, and you want to guess which is the one that was taken out of the deck. So I, I really like logic puzzles and deduction like that. So Sleuth is a fun game. I prefer it with three to five players. I've played it with seven players and it took way too long and no one knew anything because everyone only had like three cards to start or something, maybe four. But, uh, so I recommend not playing it with seven players because that was not fun. But I really like it with like three to five players.